Welcome to the next installment of Statistics in Pajamas. This week we're going to be just going over some of the basics of experimental design. Really there are entire courses devoted to some of the more traditional um, designs for experiments when they get into all of the replicates and controls and different configurations. Um, we're not going to go there because typically in natural resources uh, or ecology we're out there doing experiments in the field, in nature, so they're not as specifically designed. The experiments themselves are not as specifically designed as you might see in say the medical field or psychology or even agriculture where they can apply very specific treatments and control where they apply them. Typically we're out trying to figure out what's happening in the natural world. So we'll do a little brief overview of experimental design components and then we'll spend a little bit more time on ecological sampling because that is often what makes or breaks our ability as natural resource professionals to be able to draw any conclusions from all of the work that we do. So what is experimental design? Really, this is the process that you would go through before you embark upon any activity, whether that be um, testing a hypothesis or even just setting up a monitoring program. Right? You have to have a very detailed plan of exactly what you want to do and exactly how you're going to do that. And this is really the only way that we can ensure um, that we can maximize the amount of information we're collecting and what we can do with that information. And what's really sad is that often without a really thorough experimental design we end up just collecting reams of data and not being able to really do much with it. So very briefly to go over what the typical components are of a good thorough experimental design. Um, it always has to start with the definition of the problem. Now when we're doing um, inferential analyses or trying to make some sort of inference to a larger population, that's typically in the form of a hypothesis, right? But it also it can be just a study objective. What's the purpose for the data we're collecting? So it doesn't always have to be um, hypothesis driven. We also have to state the variables that we're interested in and we talked about um, different types of variables in last week's module. Um, but essentially we need to know what it is that we're testing for changes or differences or what it is we're measuring that we're interested in, what it is that we think might be influencing those measurements. Um, do we need controls to be able to isolate the impact of some of those independent variables? Are there covariates that we should control for? So we really have to lay out all of the variables that we think we need to measure. Okay, and then we also need to say how we're going to be measuring those, right? So are the, what are the lab methods or what are the field methods? Then the bigger part, again, the meat of what experimental design is, uh, con it consists of is the sampling design. So how do you select observations to take those measurements on? And how do you do that so that you're representing the population that you're interested in, right? And then what's the sampling unit for that? So that's all a part of the sampling design that we'll get into. And then ultimately you need all of this information. You need to know what the objective is or the hypothesis is. You need to know what all of these variables are and the nature or the character of those variables. You need to know how the measurements were collected. All of this helps you identify the correct statistical analysis. And that's complicated enough <laughs> that um, we will go over that a little bit in our next video. But just briefly, really we're going to be covering that all semester as we work through these different types of analyses, you'll get an idea for what types of questions or for what purposes they would be applied. So let's just break that down in a little bit more detail. So all good science starts with a solid research question. And if we're doing any inferential analyses, that's always got to be in the form of a hypothesis. So a statement of the expected outcome of whatever our experiment is. And the characteristics that we look for in a good hypothesis are that they're very clear and concise. So one sentence, they shouldn't be rambling. They shouldn't be stated as questions, right? They're actual statements. And they say exactly what you expect is gonna happen. And you say that based on some sound, scientific theory, observations, or other evidence. Okay, we have to know that this is a testable hypothesis, so it's possible for us to collect the data to be able to determine the answer to this hypothesis. It specifies very clearly what the key variables are, um, and then also the nature of the relationship that we expect. And then, of course, finally, it has to be pretty clear what our population of interest is so that we can be informed about what our sampling design should look like. 
So we'll just go through a couple examples, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So I think it's easier to start with the ugly. So here's the ugly. Are bat populations in decline? That is a really excellent question and one that is certainly worthy of investigation. But it's not a statement. It's framed as a question. It doesn't tell us what bat, bat populations are interested in. It doesn't tell us how we're going to measure decline. It doesn't tell us over what period. It doesn't tell us where. It doesn't tell us the population of interest. A lot of missing pieces of information here. So how about an improvement? Bat populations in Vermont are in decline. Well, that's great. Now it's a statement. And we know that we're concerned about bat populations in Vermont. But we're still not really clear on what the variables of measurement are going to be. How about if I now add in some more information? So over the past 30 years, so now I can see that we're looking at years as one of our factors. Hibernacula counts, okay, so there's my dependent variable, what I'm actually measuring, of five species of winter roosting bats. Okay, so now I know I've got a variable in there of different species have declined significantly across Vermont. So the Vermont is, is uh, really bounding my population of interest. And I specify the relationship that I expect to see, right? And I'm talking about a temporal trend, a decline, a significant decline in those hibernacula counts. Okay, so we go from the ugly to the bad to the better. And this would be an example of a solid hypothesis. How about another one? Tree growth has changed as a result of climate. Again, another research question of great interest. Um, tree growth is pretty pretty vague. How do we measure that? Has changed? Well, how has it changed as a result of climate? How are we measuring climate? So again, there are a lot of unknowns here, um, and we need to have something very solid to help us identify what our sampling design should look like and then what our statistical analysis would be. So I could improve that and I could say yearly red spruce basal area increment. Okay, there's my dependent variable and it's changed as a result of climate. Okay, I still don't know how I'm expecting it to change or what, how I'm measuring climate. So there's still a lot of information missing here. Let's try a little bit better. What if we said across New England, so now we're bounding our population of interest, yearly red spruce basal area increment, so we've now still got that dependent variable, has increased significantly over the past 75 years. So I've included the year metric as one of my factors of interest. I'm stating the nature of the relationship I expect to see, an increase in that growth over years, and I expect it to be, dri to be driven by changes in key climate indices. Okay, so I can't list all 141 of my climate indices, but I make it very clear that I have some indices that I'm going to be using as one of my factors. I mentioned that not all research or not all natural resource efforts are hypothesis driven. Some of them really are just to uh, accomplish this very specific objective. Monitoring would be a classic example of that. Descriptive studies are another example of those. So these really don't need that detailed hypothesis, but they still need enough information for us to understand what variables they're interested in and what the ultimate um, application of those measurements is. I'll give you some examples that I think are really just perfectly fine. Um, one might be to monitor the concentration of mercury deposition and rainfall at the Proctor Vermont site. So it tells us very clearly what the purpose is. We want to monitor what is it that we're monitoring, concentration of mercury, and then we've got that what our sampling unit is in rainfall and where are we doing that? What's our population of interest? Well really we're just describing that for Proctor Vermont. Another example might be to describe forest composition in Centennial Woods. Okay, we still need um, a sampling design to know how to describe that, right? So we still have additional details that we need to walk through for the experimental design. But in terms of a research statement, a research objective, that's really just fine. We know that we're interested in characterizing or describing what forest species composition and where, what's our population of interest, Centennial Woods. Similarly, we could be um, hoping to identify the geographic extent of invasive plant species at the intervale. So again, what is the purpose? We want to get a geographic extent. So now we're not just interested in describing composition in general, but actually where um, different species are occurring. Right? What kind of species? Invasive plant species. Where? At the intervale. And finally, how about this one? 
our objective is to test swimming areas for high levels of bacteria that are hazardous to human health. And we're going to use this information to inform beach clo closing. Okay, so again, we don't have to get into as much detail as we do in the hypothesis, but it still has to be very clear what we're doing and what the purpose is um, and what variables we're measuring, because that's going to help us determine that sampling design, which really is the meat of the experimental design. Once you've got that basic research question or hypothesis outlined, you also have to specify what are the specific variables of interest. You maybe had to condense that in that hypothesis or objective, but you really do need to outline in great detail exactly what your independent variables will be, right? So these are the ones that you expect to vary in nature or that you purposely change and that are driving changes in your dependent variables. So that's the one that you're really interested in the response for. So not only do we have to state what these variables are, we have to define their character. Are these continuous variables? Are they ordinal variables? Um, are they class variables? Are they nominal? So we need a lot of information there that is just going to be written down in our experimental design that again is going to help us identify our um, statistical analysis. But also when we're talking about the full experimental design, we have to think about a couple of other pieces too. One, do we have some ability to create a control? So in other words, is there some way that for some of our observations, some of our units of observation, we can hold constant some of the factors, some of these independent variables that we're interested in? Right? And if we can do that, it allows us to control for some of the other variability that's inherent in nature and, and instead isolate the true impact of these independent variables. This isn't always possible when we're out there just working in the natural world and not in a controlled setting, um, but sometimes it is. So this is always something to think about. Can I include a control? Because that really will um, help to isolate the impact of our independent variables. If we can't have a control, we might think about including a covariate. So a covariate is another factor that we expect would influence our dependent variable, right, the resulting outcome, but we can't necessarily hold them constant. We can't control them. But what we can do is measure them and include them in our statistical analyses right, as an effective control. Right? So we can just take those additional measurements and include them in our analyses. We also need to include information on how each of these variables will actually be measured. This might include detail on physically how the samples are collected. Do you stand in the water and collect them? Do you toss a bucket in out from a dam and collect the water? Um, do you have a boat that you take out? So literally, how do you collect the physical sample? Um, are there specific methods for the collection? So for example, in coring, they might uh, specify that they take two cores, one from either side of the tree, and that it has to be perpendicular to the slope of the topography that they're at. Um, maybe you have a particular um, method for measuring percent cover, and so you need to, def to define how you would do that. Um, so really, any analytical methods, any field methods, and including quality control for the collection of that data should all be described as a part of your experimental design. But now we really get into the meat of it, sampling design. Uh, when we talk about sampling design, we're specifically talking about our method of selecting what the subset of the population is we'll be taking measurements on. Right? So we know we have a population that we're interested in. We know we have variables we have to measure. So the question is, how do we decide which observations we take those measurements on. And there are a lot of accepted approaches for doing this in natural resources. And just to give you an example, because I do think that this figure illustrates quite nicely how there are so many options, even for the same um, objective or the same research question. So this is a great example from um, the U.S. Forest Service Forest Inventory and Analysis Program. They have random plots all across this country at a density of one for every 6,000 acres, and they want to take an inventory or create an inventory plot where they can take measurements of species and tree growth and tree health and, and all sorts of different factors, and then use that to be able to describe the state of America's forests. Okay, So this really does have to be random across America if we're going to be representative of 
all of America's forests. And what you see in A is an example of, of true random design. This was just randomly generated points, and what you end up with is some points that just because it's random, end up stacked right on top each of each other, some areas that aren't represented at all. Um, and so even though this is likely representative, um, it may not be um, the best approach because we probably have bias. So in other words, because these are all close to each other, they're probably likely to be similar to each other and maybe not um, truly independent just because of their geographic location. So FIA might say, well, all right, I could overlay a grid, so I knew I wanted to have a density of one plot for every 6,000 acres. They could just lay out a grid and then put a plot at the center of each of those uh, hexagons. All right, so that's another option that's perfectly viable. But they might say, yeah, but that really does just sort of leave us with these straight grid lines. Maybe they're not happy with that. Well, why not pick one random point within each of those hexagons? Another perfectly acceptable option. Um, but maybe they're more interested in replicates. They're also, they want to describe not just the entire population of America's forests, but they also would like to know how much variability there is even within close geographic um, regions. So they could now cluster plots, right? So these are still randomly located. They've randomly picked which hexagon these plots should fall into, but they're clustering them with four sets of um, concurrent plots, right? And these could not be considered independent because they're always being located together. So they're either going to be replicates, or if there were some treatment being applied, you could have maybe two that are a control and two onto which the treatments are applied. So lots of different options for experimental design. So when we're coming up with a sampling design, we really have to, to include information on several different things. We have to know how many observations we're going to collect. Um, and actually in our next video, we'll get into power analysis and talk about some ways to determine that. But clearly, you typically want to get as many observations as you can. Um, and so we're usually constrained by time or money, basically resources. But we do have to specify how many observations we plan on collecting. Then we have to specify how we're going to select those observations and where will they be located. Right? We have to specify what that sampling unit size is. Remember we talked about that unit of observation before? So we really need to specify exactly what the unit of observation is. And, and just very quickly, because I know it can be kind of confusing when we're talking about what an observation or we're talking about a unit of observation or a sampling unit is, we're really talking about what is that unit of measure. What is it that we're taking um, measurements on and quantifying that will represent that one row in our data sheet? And in some studies that might be a whole plant or an entire animal. So for example, maybe you're doing a study of bear and so you age them and you weigh them and in that case each bear would be an individual observation. Sometimes it might be parts of a plant or an animal. So for example, maybe you've gone out and collected foliage from different trees and you've done on that across uh, the entire you know county so each of those uh, vegetation samples would become an observation and maybe you would actually combine all of the samples you collected from one tree into one homogenized sample so it's that homogenized sample that becomes your observation Typically, in most natural resource applications, I would dare to say that plots are, are pretty commonly um, what our measurements are taken on. So we might have percent cover, um, or we might have uh, the species composition, like percent basal area of different species on a plot, or we might have uh, the number of invasive species, but it's the plot itself that is the unit of observation. But you can also have transects that are your unit of observation. So each transect would have one value for for each of those variables you're interested in. It could be points. You could go to random points and at each point you would be taking measurements for those variables that you're interested in. And then there are other sort of a little bit more rare and more complicated um, types of sampling where you might go out and actually um, use a point frame. So for example, you might lay a frame over the ground and where these uh, points where the lines intersect would be a point and you would record say a yes or a no there. Yes, I have plant cover or no, I don't have plant cover. And you could quantify percent cover from something like that.
And then sometimes you just take these distance approaches where you know you're going to walk a random distance and when you get there you'll stop and just take a measurement and then walk another random distance. But all of these really are that one line in your uh, Excel spreadsheet, right, where you're collecting data and each of these is going to have a measurement for the key independent variables and the dependent variable that you're interested in. Okay, so we have to be able to identify what that sampling unit, what an observation is for our study. Okay, so back to our other key information pieces for the sampling design. We have to specify how we're going to collect or summarize our data. So an example might be, say we have um, five different transects out there. Do we visit them all at once? Or do we visit half of them and then visit the other half on a different year or on a different day? Um, another example would be, do we have permanent or temporary locations? So if it's a permanent uh, sampling unit, then we know we're going to be going back there time after time to the exact same place to take the same measurements. So that informs our experimental design and the types of analyses that we're going to be using. So we have to be very clear about how we're going to collect the data on each of those sampling units, right, and whether or not we're going to be going back and revisiting those, and all of that is going to help us identify the appropriate statistical test. But really the meat of all of this, or the hardest part really, is how do you select which observations to take measurements on? Because chances are if you're out there working in the woods or on the lake or in the tundra or the Arctic anywhere, that there's going to be a million different things that you could sample, a million different ob observations. And you have to figure out how to select a subset of those observations that are representative of the population you're interested in. So I'm going to cover really briefly some of the most common um, sampling design approaches. Okay, there really are two main categories, different types of sampling design, judgmental and random sampling. Okay, so judgmental sampling is not necessarily touted as the best way to do things, but it's actually quite common and often very useful. So when we're talking about judgmental sampling, what we're saying is that we are going to the experts in the field and we have presented them with our research objectives and we ask them to tell us where they think the best places are to sample, right, based on their knowledge of the resource and on our application, our research objectives. Right? Now the problem with this is it really isn't random or independent and so we can't draw inferential conclusions, right? So we really can't make broad, statemo broad statements about populations um, and you know there's clearly the possibility for bias here but the reality is that these are really useful ways to identify observations when you're talking just about a descriptive study or in a pilot study where you just want some quick data um, on feedback uh, to figure out whether an expanded study would be worth it, right? Also, if you have to do something very quickly and you really don't have time to measure a whole bunch of different observations, you know, this would be particularly common in emergency response. So I'm going to give you um, a couple of examples that would highlight how this really can be an appropriate sampling design um, in some situations. So, so here's an example. Imagine that you are working in Yellowstone and you are tasked with estimating how the wolf population has done after a particularly harsh winter. So you want to go out there and estimate their breeding success, right, to see if they need to expand their monitoring efforts or conservation efforts. You only have time to go out there and count pups in three of your ten packs that are known in the park. So how do you identify which three packs you should go and bust into their den and play with the cute little pups, okay? Well, if you were doing a totally random sampling design, you would just randomly select three different packs to visit, right? But you could decide that maybe that's not the best use of your time. Okay, one approach to a judgmental design would be to say, well, you know, I know that there are some packs in this park that have been shown to be more vulnerable than others, either because their territory isn't quite as high quality, um, or maybe they have some aggressive pack members, um, or maybe they have are on an edge and you know they're being uh, shot by farmers for 
uh, killing livestock or, or something like that. So you could say, you know, if I really want to know whether or not additional action is necessary, I'm going to focus on those vulnerable packs. That is a judgmental selection of observations and perfectly valid um, based on the objectives of the study. Or maybe you would like to go to the packs that you know are the least impacted by you being there, right? You don't want to go into um, a den where you know that the female is going to abandon her pups if you walk in. So it might actually be safest long term for you to go into dens that are um, the least likely to have an impact on the population. Again, another judgmental approach, but certainly justified based on your objectives. Here's another example. Now imagine that you work for Vermont DEC and you are charged with monitoring um, water quality in Lake Champlain, but you know that you really only have time to collect 10 samples each month. Right? They're just, you're spread thin as all public employees are. Uh, and so you have to figure out what is the best way to monitor water quality. Okay, well, you could do it randomly and just randomly select GPS points around Lake Champlain. Uh, you could limit that to the shorefront so you don't have to have a boat and be uh, trucking all over the place, okay? but that would be sort of your classic random design. But if you're really interested in monitoring water quality, it might make sense to focus your measurements in areas where you know pollution loads are already high, right? where you would expect to see uh, maybe surges um, of pollutants after high rainwater events, right? or or where um, you might expect um, there to just be high levels in general. And so by being able to monitor those sites, you know that you're able to make the best statements about the lake overall and impact to that lake overall. So that would be a perfectly acceptable use of judgmental sampling. But typically, especially for any inferential or modeling statistical analyses, we really do have to have a probability-based sampling design. And essentially, this means some form of random sampling. And what that means is that every member of the population we're interested in has an equal opportunity to be selected for measurements. Right? And if we do this with large enough sample size, with enough observations, we know that we will be representative of the larger population. The underlying assumption of these probability-based sampling designs is that the sample you collect is representative of the larger population of interest. But that isn't always the case when you are taking random samples. Okay? It, it is if you have a large enough number of observations, but often you can be limited if you only have a small number of observations you're able to collect. Also, you have to make sure that you're really truly doing a randomized, unbiased sampling selection method. Right? We have to look at our observations and make sure that we have a good dispersion of the range of this response variable we would expect to see. Right? And then we also have to make sure that each of our observations are independent from each of the others. Right? So they're not spatially connected to each other. So as long as we're doing these things, then that probability-based um, sampling design will work for us. We need to have uh, unbiased random sampling. We have to make sure we have a large enough sample size. We have to go back and look at those observations and make sure they cover the expected range that we would see in our full population, make sure we haven't missed anything. And we have to make sure that these are not spatially correlated. There are several different ways that we can accomplish random sampling. The most basic is just simple random sampling. And you literally are just randomly picking from the entire population. And this can be done in a lot of automated ways. Um, you can use GIS to generate random points within a certain study area, and it will just plop them down. Um, some people use random number generators to specify um, lat longs that they should sample at, or uh, which iteration of um, the population that comes in they would sample. So say, for example, they, they question every sixth person that comes through. Um, they might be out in the woods and take a random azimuth and distance and just walk to that point and then sample there. So it really is just completely random. And this is really useful when you know you've got a pretty homogeneous population. Right? So you know you have variability, but it's not concentrated in certain areas. Like you don't have um, one, you know, 
type of dependent variable response over here and then something completely different over there. If you have that type of variability or you have hot spots, this type of simple random sampling is probably not ideal and it might miss some of that variability. You know, an example of when this might be appropriate, imagine you have a Superfund site and you have to take uh, soil chemistry samples from across a Superfund site. Um, you could just use ARC to randomly place points on that map on that property and go to those and sample. You could use random number tables um, to navigate to random bearing and distances from say the center of the property or from you know your entrance point at the road. So those are all perfectly um, viable but you, you do have to notice that there's a possibility that you will have um, some clustered areas and then some areas that aren't represented at all. But if your population is relatively homogeneous, in other words, if we expect the level of contamination to be pretty much consistent throughout the Superfund site, then that should be perfectly acceptable. If your target population is more heterogeneous, so in other words, you expect there to be a lot of variability across the population, and that variability can sort of be assigned to different classes based on characteristics, say for example, based on soil type or based on um, aspect or elevation, right? So in other words, you know you're going to have variability, but you can identify characteristics that would group your population into different categories based on that variability. In this case, you can do something Thing called stratified random sampling. So you're still selecting random points, but you're making sure that you have an equal number of points in each of these different strata, each of these different um, ways of categorizing the variability of your population. So in this example, we have um, generated 10 random samples, but within each of these different strata. Right, so that would be a randomized, a stratified randomized sample. And what's nice is it allows you to make sure that you're capturing all of the variability in your population, but that you're still using a random design. Another approach to random design are these systematic or grid sampling techniques. So there are lots of different ways to do this. Sometimes they might just lay down a square grid. Um, sometimes it can be triangular grids. With the FIA data, we saw an example of a hexagonal grid. What's nice about these is that they ensure uniform coverage across your area of interest. So you can be sure that you are really getting a nice geographic spread in your sampling. And these are especially useful for identifying hot spots, right? So say you know you have um, contamination out there somewhere, but you're not sure where. By sampling at each of these locations, right, you're covering the whole area without having to measure everything, right? So you figure out how much you can do, and then that allows you to lay down a grid. This would be fewer observations. This would be more observations. You would sample at each intersecting point. Right? And this allows you to really identify geographic patterns um, in whatever it is that you're measuring. An example of this grid sampling is in place at the Bartlett Experimental Forest run by the U.S. Forest Service. At this forest, they have 500 permanent plots. These are 10th hectare plots, and they have them spaced at uh, you know consistent intervals. The, each of these transects is separated by a consistent distance, and each of these points then becomes a plot where they take measurements. And their goal in doing this was to make sure that they had complete coverage of their entire research force so that they could uh, you know, accurately depict not only the composition of their forest, but also be sure to identify where species composition might change. So for example, make sure they had coverage at upper elevations, even though that didn't cover as much of an area as these lower elevations. Another common sampling approach when the objective is to find very specific hot spots um, or you're looking for some rare occurrences or to use sort of a combination of that ra simple random sampling or gridded sampling with what's called a cluster sample. Okay, so this is called adaptive cluster sampling and essentially you either randomly select plots for initial measurements or maybe you do it on the grid that would be fine too and wherever you find that rare measurement that you're looking for so say for example you find it here you would then expand your measurements around each of those points so if you came and you sampled all of these original bold points right, and then you found out that really just these two or three were the only ones that have what you were looking for. You would then go back, and again, because it's on a grid, it could still be considered random, 
right? You would lay down new observations on a grid around each of those points. When you saw that it didn't occur here, you would know you didn't have to expand any farther this way. But you would see that it did occur here, so you would continue to expand that until you identify the boundary of that rare um, occurrence, that rare measurement that you're looking for. So that would be the adaptive cluster sampling. And a really common application for this type of sampling design is emergency response, usually to horrible things. Um, you know, and so the oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico would be an excellent example of that. A lot of it you could see and you could map from the air, but a lot of it also was oil that stayed below the surface, and so that required uh, sampling at different depths. And so to identify what the larger column looked like, they could use an adaptive cluster sample um, to be able to maximize their efficiency of collecting samples. Right? Where they find the oil, they would then collect more and more until they identified the boundaries. Another example of that two-phase sampling design is ranked set sampling. So essentially what you're doing with this approach is you're going out there and you're randomly taking samples, right? But you're not doing your full suite of measurements for all of those. You're really just sort of doing a first pass, a quick assessment of those. And then you go back and you examine your values, your measurements for each of those, and you identify from those a subset where you would go back and collect more detailed measurements. And this is a really interesting way of sort of using the random sampling, right? Because you've randomly picked all of the locations, all the observations to begin with. But then you can use professional judgment to determine which of those you would do the final and more complete assessment on, right? And a perfect example of this is soil sampling. So soil uh, chemistry, soil horizons can be highly variable, even from, say, like right up here to right down here. Microtopography, history of, of tree tip-ups, uh, you know, collection of debris, water tables rising to the surface, highly variable, even across a very small spatial scale. And so typically what you'll do is you'll go out and take these little quickie mini cores, and you'll get an idea of what a typical core looks like for that plot. So now you can go around, you can do this up here, over here, over here, you take like 15 of those, and then you say, you know what, this one right here, that one looked just like most of them, right? That was really typical of most of these mini cores that I pulled out. And that's where you could dig your larger pit and then actually characterize your soil profile and collect your soil samples. Now, if you're not necessarily interested in the spatial variability or temporal variability in your observations, you really just want to describe the overall population. That's when composite sampling might be useful. So in this example, what you're doing is you're taking multiple samples, say from around a plot. You go out to that same soil plot and you're taking a bunch of different mini cores. You then can just mix them all together, smoosh them all up, and then take a small subsample from that homogenized, that, that composite mix of those smaller subsamples. So in this instance, we basically have replicates, right? These are replicates. And what we're doing is we're physically combining those to run our analyses and take our measurements on. Right? And again, this is really common with soil sampling. Maybe for all of those 10, 15 mini cores we collected, instead of just using them to identify where to dig a pit, I keep all of them and I combine them. Right? So I take all these cores here, these individual cores, I mush them together, shake them up in a bag, and then because my actual analysis can only be run on a very small sample in the lab, I would take a subsample of that and use that to give myself sort of a typical measurement value for that plot. Right? So that's again perfectly um, reasonable. The other approach is I could have kept each of these cores separate, but then I would have had to run my lab analyses on all of these replicates and then just average them together. So this is just sort of a physical way of doing that before I get to the laboratory. Those are pretty much the most common sampling designs that you'll find used in natural resources. Um, but I wanted to end here with an example because it's one thing to sort of, I don't know, memorize or, you know, think that you understand all these different approaches, describe these different methods. Um, and it's another to actually use it in an example. So I wanted us to consider this study where we're trying to measure E. coli levels and we're doing this for a specific swimming area, right? And we want to do this with the express uh, goal of being able to decide when we should close down that beach, right? But we also 
would like to look at the temporal trends so that we can make predictions about maybe when we should sample more frequently in the future. So in other words, are there certain times of the day when E. coli is higher? Um, are there certain seasons when E. coli is higher? Or is it after rain events that we see higher E. coli? So we also do want to have that additional um, inferential possibility in there. So the population of interest, really that target population, is that water, all of the water in our swimming area, and that's delineated by the buoys. And we want to know how the E. coli fluctuates from May 1st to September 15th. So that's our population of interest. Okay, the sampling unit that we're choosing, right, is that we're going to be going out and we're going to be taking five randomly selected water samples, right? So five different locations throughout this swimming area, and they're going to be random. Every day it's going to be a different random location, okay? And we're going to take measurements, collect those water samples six inches below the surface, okay? But we're also going to select three subsamples, three replicates at each of these five randomly selected locations, right? And that's because we don't know if we could have contaminants in the actual vial that we're, we're using to collect the water in, or there could be contaminants in the lab. So we want to have some replicates at each of those locations. Okay, and then we're going to collect this every day at 7 a.m. and at 2 p.m. Okay, so that's essentially laying out the experimental design for us. Okay, so from that information, can you determine the number of observations that we have. In statistical analyses, this is referred to as our sample size. So if we knew that we had five randomly selected locations and we're collecting at those every day at 7 a.m. and 2 p.m., right? how many total measurements do we have? And keep in mind that we have our three replicates at each of those five locations. So three replicates, five locations, that's 15 observations at 7 a.m and 15 observations at 2 p.m., right? So we essentially have 30 total measurements per day. This is not how many observations we have, it's how many measurements we're making, right? How many uh, water samples we're sending to the lab. But we have to remember that our sampling method was this simple random sampling, but with these fixed subsamples, these replicates, right? And so because of that, even though we have 30 measurements each day, we don't have 30 observations because those replicates are not independent, right? Those replicates are all taken at the exact same location, right? They're not randomly selected. They're not independent of each other. And so we actually have to average our E. coli values for each of those replicates, right? And use that average value for the location, for each location. So that means that really we only have 10 observations each day. We have five at 7 a.m. because each of those three replicates has been combined for each location. And then we have five more at 2 p.m. Okay, bear with my handwriting here. I'm gonna to try to summarize. So our unit of observation in this case would be a water sample, right? So we've got a sample water. It's gonna have an ID and we're going to have one for each of five locations and one for each time of day and then one for each day, right? So my spreadsheet would look something, oh my goodness, something like that. <laughs> So now it gets to the fun part. How can you actually run statistical analyses on this data you've collected? Well, based on our design, there are really a lot of different things that we could do. If we wanted to look at a time series of E. coli, we could take our 10 observations each day, right? And we could use days as our treatment, right? So that could be our independent variable would be the day. And then we could actually plot how those E. coli values change over time. Right? We'd have a mean and a standard deviation for each day. So here's an example with days on the x-axis. Here's our E. coli concentration. Right? And we can see our mean value for all 10 of those samples on that day, 10 of those observations, right? and the variability among those 10 as well. And then we can use a time series analysis to look at those patterns and determine whether or not it's significant. Okay, but really, I just want to reiterate how important it is to know what an observation is 
or as opposed to just replicates. If we had used 30, an n of 30, because that's how many laboratory analyses of E. coli we do for each day, if we had used that n of 30, our analysis would have much more power and would therefore be very likely to make a type 1 error, say that there was some significant trend where there really wasn't. We have to make sure that we're really using the sample size of 10 each day, the five random locations in the morning and in the evening. And so that's going to determine the power of our test. Okay? But we can also ask other questions with this data set. Say we wanted to know how E. coli concentrations differ between morning and afternoon. Right? We still know that we have 10 observations on each day, but now we have to split them between the two sampling times. We have five random observations from the morning and five random observations in the, in the afternoon. And so what we do is we're essentially breaking that down into two groups. We have the morning E. coli, we have the afternoon E. coli. We can come up with a mean for all of those 30 days in the month of July we were interested in and the variability around that mean. And it gives us an idea of whether or not we have a significant difference between morning and afternoon E. coli counts. And that's essentially a t-test. We could get even fancier. Maybe we were interested in both differences between morning and afternoon E. coli concentrations, but we also want to know how those change over time throughout the summer. Right? So these are two different things we're interested in. We're interested in comparing two different times, morning and afternoon. Those were really our treatments. But we also want to know how those change over time. That's our second independent variable. So now we would have a mean to the little dots and a standard deviation for the morning and for the afternoon, right? So we could actually break those apart and this becomes a repeated measures analysis of variance, right? So we're able to see how the trends over time are changing and how they are different for the two different treatments of morning or afternoon. So lots of possibilities just in this one sort of simple design that we have created. So we've covered a lot in this one and I'm hoping it's not too overwhelming. Just keep in mind that there isn't only one way to design an experiment. There isn't only one way to conduct an experiment, right? There's no a correct way to sample. It doesn't always have to be completely simple random. Okay, that's our knee-jerk reaction. But what I'm hoping you get out of this is that you need to balance what you can do, right, based on your resources and what you need to accomplish so that you can design something that most efficiently gets you to the objectives of your study. And as long as you can justify your selection of sampling technique and describe that accurately so that it could be repeated by somebody else um, and make sure that your sample selection is unbiased and representative of the entire population. Now keep in mind that's only if you're interested in inferential or modeling statistics. If you're just describing or doing a pilot study or an emergency response that wouldn't be uh, necessary. But you know as long as you're, you're doing that with the sample you're collecting you should be all set. So that's it for experimental design and sampling. Uh, hopefully you'll have fun playing with some of our uh, examples in class. Until next time.